describing all of your, you know, all these lulls and achievements uh, over your illustrious career. I, I can do that, that if you like. Yeah, yeah that sounds that's actually weird. We all know that, but um, I think, uh, you know, there's no time like the present. Carpe diem. So, uh, um, uh, for all everyone calling in, we are very, very fortunate to have one of um, our, our outstanding um, pulmonology experts uh, talk to us about a subject that uh, not only is extremely common in, in uh, uh, you know, in general practice, but also is something that we see our own members coming to us after they've been to doctor after doctor after doctor and get rid of their persistent cough. So without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Eden, uh, Chief of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at St. Luke's and Roosevelt Hospitals in, uh, in New York City. Yes, well, very much. Uh, appreciate it, and I appreciate uh, being asked. Um, I chose this topic because um, I, uh, I get to see and I get to uh, consult on a large number of patients, as you mentioned, uh, who have uh, uh, chronic cough, and 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 this or chronic cough is defined as a cough uh, lasts for a, as you'd imagine a, a reasonable amount of time, and the arbitrary figure that we use or the arbitrary time is is eight weeks. Um, but having said that, a lot of people um, I see are much more concerned about their cough, uh, and they're or tend to come in a little bit earlier, uh, and, and, and cough is one of those things that can be associated with serious illness, um, and uh, is the most common respiratory uh, symptom, therefore uh, it's well known in the community and on the internet, I might add, that cough uh, uh, lasts for a while, you should seek your physician. Um, and so I'm going to address uh, those issues. Uh, management, diagnosis of a chronic cough, and you will uh, appreciate that the amount of uh, data that's available um, in terms of clinical studies is quite limited. And the art of medicine, I think, uh, in the management of these of these patients is um, is for and is paramount. Uh, let's proceed. So I'm going to present a case that is actually has been uh, referred to me by best doctors uh, some time ago. So this, um, I'll read it for you just briefly. So he's 57 and he's had clear sputum for one year with cough. Um, uh, complains of mucus. Your patients complain of mucus at the back of the throat or a sensation that they can't clear their their femoral mucus. Uh, it's worse in the morning when he gets up and, and at night uh, as he retires. Um, an important negative is shortness of breath. Um, cough associated with shortness of breath um, is usually uh, um, a cardiac or pulmonary condition. There's a tickle in the throat. That's a non-specific finding, but can be associated with a variety of of uh, etiologists. As normal in these cases, they, um, patients are started with a, a course of antibiotics, usually at broad spectrum, and usual for these cases, uh, there's no response. And in my view, once you haven't responded to one course of antibiotics, giving a course of antibiotics um, is uh, 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 the law of diminishing returns and increasing side effects and potential for, uh, uh, for adverse outcomes. So here's the patient presenting in your office, and these are the sort of additional history that is necessary uh, to give some uh, background and uh, diagnostic, diagnostic potential for these cases. And in this uh, gentleman, one would ask, how did it begin? Has there been any change in your environment, work and play, household hobbies, exercise program, new pets, new or new husband? Presenting factors, what brings the cough on? 
cold air, laughing, excitement, emotion, acting factors. Um, these are things like strong smells, dust, fumes, exercise, pumpations of the coughing, pain back, pain in the chest, incontinence, syncope, uh, embarrassment, social isolation, depression. Morbid conditions, diabetes, hypertension, cardiac disease, medications, some of which can aggravate or cause cough. The big ones, of course, are the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and any agents that dry the upper airways. Review of systems to get a general sense of other diseases. Rheumatological diseases, for example, arthritis, arthralgia, yak, uh, already mentioned, shortness of breath, obesity, smoking history. And prior treatments. Normal patients come in with a large list of agents that have been tried for them and have been effective. These will include over the counter cough medications. Sometimes bronchodilators, asthma treatments, sometimes uh, anti reflux therapy, uh, antibiotics, nasal sprays. So, the gentleman has a past history notable for recurrent sinus infections. This brings up possible upper airway condition that may be aggravating cough. Cough aggravated by change in ambient temperature. This is a very common. Temperature from warm to cold, coming in from a hot weather into an air-conditioned uh, room. But sometimes also high heat and humidity can precipitate cough, particularly in those who exercise. This is situated near water. Very important when one is considering ambient pollution, ambient contamination with, for example, mold spores. Also, it's in a bakery. This is a, a possibility of occupational disease, Baker's asthma, which comes in with cough. He has known allergies. He will limit it to smoke, raising the potential for chronic bronchitis. But in this case, he had given up 15 years ago, and unlikely that chronic bronchitis would continue after so long after quitting cigarette smoking. I also asked the patient about passive inhalation of cigarette smoke from a spouse or relative or um, or some other uh, home or in, uh, work environment uh, can aggravate cough too. <coughs> Excuse me. The reflux symptoms. I always ask about heartburn or gas or indigestion symptoms. Many patients have, uh, or at least some patients have heartburn symptoms, but remember that these itself can be precipitated by cough itself. So, it's in abdominal pressure can cause some transient reflux uh, and uh, perhaps cause some heartburn symptoms from time to time. She's been treated for hypertension, so you must go through his medications that are being used. I mentioned a couple of them that can aggravate or cause cough. And as normal, uh, the patient had used over the counter medications. Um, and uh, so his doctor had given him some nasal supply. Both of these were ineffective. On examination, uh, he had some mild nasal congestion. Uh, one of the doctors uh, heard a transient wheeze. Hepatitis are generally unhelpful in chronic cough conditions, uh, but uh, a uh, allergy uh, pointers, allergy indicators, be helpful. I usually just get a serum IgE, total IgE, and ESO for count on the CBC. That's it for blood tests. Um, we sent to an ENT uh, physician, and uh, the, uh, 
the examination indicated, and I put uh, cause around that, indicated gastrointestinal reflux. I'll be talking about that in a moment or two. A scan of the sinuses was negative. Current uh, thinking suggests that CT scans of the sinuses are not helpful uh, to diagnose and manage chronic cough. A uh, cardiac stress test, which were normal, an echogram, which were normal, and he started on empiric uh, PI, protein pump inhibitor therapy, allergy, and nasal therapy. That's the case so far. And just to review with you uh, some of the pathways, uh, the receptors here are in red. I don't know if I can... Can I... Do you see the pointer here? Uh, I don't think so. No. Right. Well, anyway, I'm going to describe. The red dots are the sites of um, cough receptors, low esophagus, trachea, major bronchus, nasopharynx, Pathways for cough transmission, cough stim stimulus transmission, are through the vagus nerve and the superior laryngeal nerve, which is why, of course, you cough if you choke on food, um, to the a cough center in the uh, uh, breaststem, and then uh, impacted by the cortical control centers, uh, which explains why, to some extent, you can inhibit uh, cough just with uh, so those receptors are scattered throughout the, the bronchial tree and also in the, in the lower esophagus. There are a variety of uh, mucosal um, receptors that are sensitive to a variety of uh, external stimuli. Shown here is the bronchial epithelium at the top with mucus secretion. The second epithelial uh, uh, juice contains mucous glands, blood vessels, and uh, inflammatory cells, as shown uh, on the left-hand side there. There is a submucosal and smooth muscle that can contract uh, during an asthmatic attack. The neural pathways, sensory pathways, that are responsive cough stimulations include RAR, uh, those are the rapid accommodating receptors that are sensitive to smoke and acid, to salt, saline, and they can factors such as atelectasis and uh, pneumonia. The C fibers are also responsive but to a different set of stimuli. These are C fibers responsive to chemical stimuli, such as those released during inflammation. Of other chemicals that are involved in the cough uh, pathway, some as are indicated in the red boxes. Uh, TRPV is a receptor for a veloid compound or capsaicin which, as you know, is commonly found in peppers. And for the been to Szechuan restaurants, one knows the symptoms when you take in too much red pepper, you start to cough. And these are receptors that are responsible for that, the TRPV1 receptors that are sensitive to extract of peppers. Uh, Calcitonin gene-related peptide is another receptor that can respond to cough stimuli and chemical stimuli. H plus here, right at the top there in small letters, is a symbol for acid, and that may be the pathway involved in reflux esophagitis from acid reflux. These, ways, these neurological pathways um, combine in the vagus nerve and feed into the cough center in the brain stem, which is also susceptible to some chemical stimuli, such as the prostaglandins um, and neurokinins, NK. And this is the reflexes of cough, which involve muscles of the diaphragm, 
intercostal muscles, laryngeal muscles, and abdominal muscles. And this contraction of the muscles can cause pain and discomfort. And patients often complain of uh, pain uh, and uh, sometimes quite severe pain uh, in the muscle groups associated with cough. So I'd like to think of cough is upper airway, lower airway, and non-airway. And please remember in your practices that cough is often a combination of factors that include all components of potential cough pathways. The upper airway most common causes of cough are rhinosinusitis and upper airway cough syndrome. Now, these upper airway cough syndrome used to be called postnasal drip. Now, the problem with this is postnasal drip is common in all people. And those who cough tend to be a little bit more sensitive to mucus at the back of the throat. That shows there is a direct relationship between nasal drip and cough. I do think the relationship is is the nose is particularly congested and inflamed, shown here on the left hand side. This is the inferior turbinate that's swollen with mucus. The nose is congested with inflammation and edema. Then that normally are filtered through the nose enter directly into the larynx and upper airways and then can stimulate cough. So, for example, cold air. Patients complain of cough with laughing or when breathing in cold air. If their nose is clogged and they can't breathe through the nose to warm and filter that cold air, then the cold air may stimulate receptors at the back of the throat and upper airways and stimulate off reflex. So I think that the reason that patients with postnasal drip have cough is because they can't breathe through their nose um, and it uh, increases the sensitivity to upper airway stimuli. On the side are two, are two uh, photographs, one showing enlarged tonsils and the other showing what they call a granular pharynx, the, the bumpy pharynx on the back. Enlarged tonsils have recently been described to be associated with chronic cough. The mechanisms for this is not clear, and in the same, uh, for the same reason, uh, airway resistance syndrome, sleep-related uh, brain disorders are sometimes also associated with cough. We see why there may be associations and confounding variables that have not been uh, described well yet. The grand pharynx below there with the little bumps on it uh, is an indication of chronic allergic disease um, and maybe a pointer to uh, allergic rhinitis, allergic sinusitis, allergic cough, or perhaps asthma itself. And the uh, view that many otolaryngologists uh, view when they make the diagnosis of uh, reflux esophagitis or reflux laryngopharyngitis. There's a deep of the vocal cords. You can see some bumps in the pharynx there on the larynx uh, on the right hand side and a demer of the posterior commissure of the larynx. All are pointers that there is perhaps reflux. The problem with this diagnosis is that the association between reflux and cough, the association between laryngeal hypersensitivity and cough, are unclear. And the, uh, the area is still quite controversial. I'll take another look at this a little bit later on in the lecture. Uh, but suffice to say, in my view, the big prescribers these days of PPIs are otolaryngologists. It seems to be a diagnosis 
uh, that is very common in those circles. Um, and uh, uh, in my view, may be overdiagnosed. I will point out, however, that laryngeal, laryngeal hypersensitivity can give rise to quite frightening symptoms. Patients come in with choking, gasping for breath symptoms, severe attacks of cough that ends in a whoop, uh, feeling that they're going to suffocate, uh, one or two patients with cough syncope, and this may be due to increased sensitivity of the larynx, of the nerve receptors within the larynx uh, that are um, responsive to small, uh, otherwise uh, non-effective non stimuli. And it may be that reflux or acid or, or sinus disease aggravate the sensitivity of this reflex, uh, giving rise to this condition, which, as I say, is very frightening for patients. Again, um, that post-infectious upper airway uh, inflammation, post infectious upper airway sensitivity um, uh, can be the cause of more persistent cough following uh, infections such as pertussis uh, and other uh, bacteria and viruses that I've uh, indicated here. But basically, almost any infectious bronchitis or pneumonia can lead to a post-infectious cough which can be persistent. Generally requires reassurance and, gradual, and generally is self-limiting, uh, can hang on for a few weeks after the event. After uh, viewing the upper airway causes of cough and diagnosis, I'll talk a little bit about lower airway, which is where basically my area of expertise is focused. I did the lower airway into two um, lists as shown on this slide. The list on the left is um, the general pulmonary diseases that can lead to chronic cough. They include, as shown here, in, and I'll list them in, in terms of how common they are, I would say chronic bronchitis is probably the most common, post-infectious cough following pneumonia, um, and then uh, bronchiectasis. I see quite a bronchiectasis in my office. Endobronchial diseases are very rare. Um, in smokers, uh, we, uh, you always think of lung cancer, of course, but generally not uh, uh, not common. Tracheomalacia is quite rare, it's collapse of the trachea and bronchial tubes through loss of, loss of elasticity. And this is highlighted by uh, difficulty in clear mucus uh, and wheezing, often misdiagnosed as asthma. And the initial lung disorders, of which there are a whole host, um, uh, are associated with cough uh, as a presenting symptom. On the right hand side, of diagnosis, which are overlapping, are due to IgE eosophilic mediated disease. Pick cough is diagnosis that's not very commonly in this country, but it's common in Asian uh, in, in, in Asian countries. Eosophilic um, bronchitis is less commonly made in this country too, it's commonly made in Western Europe but is nevertheless a, a, a clear entity. And they orient asthma, which a lot of people think about um, as a possible cause of, of uh, cough. I'll throw up this chest x-ray um, to show you some of the um, chest x-ray signs of, uh, of bronchitis. Uh, there's some clustered nodules in the left upper lobe. 
Uh, there's some hazy markings around the heart borders, uh, uh, which are consistent with the disease, uh, particularly in the right middle lobe and the lingular segments. Um, and best X-ray such as this would would probably point to a diagnosis of uh, bronchiectasis, possibly chronic infection. Um, but a check X-ray is a reasonable first step uh, to um, excluding. Uh, significant uh, lung disease. So in the case, after a month, uh, despite the diagnosis of um, of relux, the patient has not responded to either PPI or nasal therapy. Um, he went ch uh, chest X-ray, which was normal, and function tests, spirometry. So uh, no bronchospasm, no flow obstruction, and no response to bronchodilators. In view, a normal chest X-ray, normal pulmonary function tests, includes significant lung disease, serious lung disease, in the overwhelming majority of patients. Very rarely with any further testing for a with chronic cough if the chest ray is normal and the pulmonary function test shows no abnormalities. Now, yes, you can have an occasional patient with who swallowed or aspirated a peanut, um, you know, many, many years ago uh, and is sitting there causing cough or someone with a small endobronchial lesion that could be causing cough but these are extremely rare, and I don't think it's justified to proceed with uh, work up with CT scans and more advanced diagnostic uh, procedures uh, uh, for these extremely unlikely possibilities. And then with this, with the differential diagnosis of low airway causes of chronic cough in a patient with a normal chest X-ray and pulmonary function tests. The diagnosis that I entertain with this scenario. Remission cough area asthma, normal pulmonary function tests do not include the diagnosis. A low atopic cough, normal pulmonary function tests and chest X-ray of course do not exclude that diagnosis either. A head of alert allergy uh, sensitivity is an important one in the history for making this diagnosis as well. well. Eosolic bronchitis, post-fectious bronchitis, and irritative bronchitis. Irritative bronchitis is a diagnosis that's made in patients who are uh, complaining of uh, exposure to, um, to work-related dust and fumes uh, that uh, irritating to them, and they describe this um, irritating, burning, uh, usually a very uh, emotional context to this type of, of patient um, who um, is uh, worried about the effects of, of, uh, of exposure um, and uh, is coughing uh, with plus minus uh, mucus. Um, uh, the diagnosis has an overlap with reactive airway dysfunction syndrome, uh, which is diagnosis uh, secondary to acute exposure of an irritating fume or compound. Normally, this diagnosis is reserved for patients in the work environment. I have had, had patients who, who uh, work at, uh, for example, shops like Saks and Bloomingdale's who are exposed to scents and perfumes and complain of irritation and cough as a result of that. So on, uh, uh, in patients with uh, cough, two bronchial challenge testing. Bronchial challenge testing is, um, makes diagnosis of bronchial hyper-responsiveness. It's an artificial test in that giving the patient in increasingly concentrated uh, compounds 
eventually stimulate uh, receptors in the airways uh, and uh, result in smooth muscle contraction uh, and bronchial constriction. What we use in our lab is methacholine, which is a, a common and standard uh, uh, agent. Others have been used as well, such as histamine um, and more recently mannitol. This here uh, does show a 20% drop in FEV1, the highest concentration of methacholine that we use. We use a, um, a, a quick or um, curtailed uh, protocol in our lab. Um, this, uh, this result would, you might think, would be diagnostic of, but diagnostic of asthma. It is not. Um, bronchial hyperresponsiveness um, has a large number of associated conditions um, and is not diagnostic of asthma. Um, yes, asthmatics do have bronchial hyperresponsiveness. But in this particular case, which is not the patient I'm talking about, by the way, the response to methacholine was at a very high concentration, a relatively high concentration. Um, and, and therefore, the bronchial hyperresponsiveness of this, in this patient, particular patient was really too high. The risk of methacholine was uh, at heart too high a concentration to all this diagnostic of asthma. Bronchial Bronchial challenge testing is pretty good at excluding asthma. It has a 80 to 90 percent positive predictive value. Uh, a positive test um, is less helpful um, to make that diagnosis. Um, and so the not diagnosis of cough variant asthma, uh, it's supported by a positive methacholine chest test, but not diagnosed. Is it bronchitis, on the other hand, and a topic bronchitis? Are methacholine or bronchial challenge negative? Therefore, it uh, might be helpful excluding those diagnoses if the patient does respond to methacholine or another bronchial challenge test. The right um, is uh, a smear of a uh, sputum sample showing a, an alveolar macrophage on the left, uh, the big cytoplasmic to nucleus radio, and neutrophils uh, scattered about. Uh, this is a non eosinophilic bronchitis, the sort of thing that one would see in chronic bronchitis associated with cigarette smoke. Is eosinophilic bronchitis again the alveolar macrophage shown as the last cell and scattered uh, eosinophils in a, in, a, in a background of an occasional neutrophil. Custom induction and testing is for labor intensive in our institution. Uh, the patients need to come in uh, for, to respiratory therapy, they have to go into a um, a room that has uh, negative pressure uh, air circulation uh, in case they have tuberculosis, and it's a, and it's a big deal. So it's a bit difficult to do this routinely, uh, but I have had occasion to uh, induce sputum in one or two patients whose diagnosis points to uh, eosinophilic disease. in our lab is we measure exhaled nitric oxide. In the patient, the exhaled nitric oxide was normal. The nitric oxide is produced by nitric oxide enzyme synthetases which convert to citrulline with the release of nitric oxide. It's quite complicated in terms of its regulation. But measurements of this exhaled uh, gas uh, can point to the diagnosis when elevated to eosinophilic bronchitis or atopic bronchitis and is normal or normal in 
uh, cough variant asthma and bronchitis. So we do that routinely in our lab in patients with asthma uh, or patients with cough to uh, determine their exhaled nitric oxide. In this case, both the uh, challenge test and the exhaled nitric oxide was no were normal. So at this point in time, I, would, I have excluded pulmonary disease or pulmonary conditions um, as a cause of cough. Uh, I haven't entirely excluded variant asthma, um, but uh, I don't think anything points to that diagnosis at this point. Begin to think about non-airway conditions. The EI and esophageal disease, and we've had a diagnosis of um, risk from an ENT uh, physician that has failed uh, PPIs for uh, four weeks, um, and uh, in fact, uh, that makes the diagnosis less likely but does not exclude it entirely because uh, the courses of the PPIs needed uh, are relatively long. They should not have cardiac disease uh, indicated by his workup. The nerve has a branch that is the external auditory canal and the wax impaction uh, is a cause of cough. So all it's worth looking on the uh, in the ears. Uh, the atrogenic, the patient is not on any medications that would be causing cough. And serious conditions. I'll have a little. I'll have a word about, uh, with that about that in a, in a moment or two. GI flux is generally thought of as acid, but in fact, non-acid solid, uh, solid reflux, gas reflux, are conditions that can lead to inflammation, upper airway sensitivity, stimulate esophageal receptors, um, and cause perhaps cough. If whatever of PPIs in chronic cough is very controversial. Analysis uh, that's conducted in the Lancet. There, as you see, two clinical trials that are uh, crossover clinical trials that showed an advantage to PPIs um, in over, over placebo um, in reducing uh, the number of coughs uh, in those patients with chronic. Now, um, many of these studies are uh, flawed um, in very substantial and important ways, um, often flawed by um, referral biases to cough centers, uh, by uh, selection biases. And by inadequate or poor documentation of coughing, clear that self-reported coughing is not an objective measure of the effectiveness of therapy. Fortunately, many trials um, rely on reports of cough improvement following uh, medication. an earlier meta-analysis, but more recently some trials have indicated effectiveness of PPIs in reducing cough in patients with chronic cough. I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Eden, in those trials, is a non-selected group of patients who are going to cough centers with chronic cough, or is it specifically looking at people who are thought possibly to have reflux-associated cough? 
Now, those are patients who go to cough centers uh, that are unselected. Okay. And they're given an empiric trial under, uh, under uh, conditions, um, you know, certain control conditions of PPS. And in fact, uh, th that sort of empiric therapy is often tried in the community uh, based on either a history of uh, reflux or, um, or, or an indication of reflux, or even just given uh, empirically without any history or physical exam findings as a trial for patients who have cough. Right. And in fact, I don't think the evidence supports that, although you will always find patients who say, oh yes, I, I, um, yes, I did, uh, I did uh, they were helpful, uh, or, or my cough is better now. You know, after uh, you know eight weeks of PPI therapy, certain proportion of patients will improve anyway. Number one, and number two, uh, there's a clear, you know a clear placebo uh, effect here of any medication that we that we give our patients. Right. So I am not convinced that PPIs are effective in cough related to reflux. Reflux common, reflux occurs, for example, in patients who cough, in hematic patients who cough, um, and um, it's not convinced by the evidence right now that uh, uh, PPS are effective. So uh, this this gentleman um, has um, his PPI. And he's tried his nasal therapy. He's been excluded to lung disease. And um, a physical exam is non-diagnostic. Um, therefore, one begins to enter the murky field of, um, of cough therapy. And um, th this becomes very difficult. Um, this requires uh, a great deal of, um, of uh, patience a great deal of interaction with the patient, a great deal of reassurance, um, and one begins to tease out some of these pa some of the patients who present this way um, as um, a overriding or an overwhelming cough reflux hypersensitivity. They their cough is precipitated by anything and everything without any clear pattern or with any clear underlying etiology. Um, and I always liken it to chronic pain. It's difficult to diagnose. Um, is sort of key in terms of its workup. Uh, very subjective. Uh, and, and, and is often a chronic syndrome with uh, exacerbations and remissions. Um, and as the as lungs do not, not themselves, uh, the lungs and the upper airways do not themselves cause the pain, cough is a substitute for pain. And uh, most of these patients have cough reflex abnormalities, cough reflex hypersensitivity, mediated by the neuronal pathways that I mentioned earlier, and aggravated or not aggravated by a variety of factors uh, which have no or very little basis uh, in rational uh, scientific uh, uh, algorithm. And then one comes to a decision in practice uh, that one has stretched the limits of diagnosis uh, and uh, one then now has to treat the patient. That work is a uh, diminishing return on investment um, and uh, one now has to embark on a semi-irrational uh, uh, treatment of patients leaving a scientific objectivity behind. Uh, with, with, uh, with clear 
diagnosis, we're in better shape. And at least here in this table are some of the cause of the cough that are amenable to um, rational therapy. I would put this in um, as a summary of what we would, what I would do with patients who have a, a, a diagnosis that's been made. Smoking-related cough, you would avoid smoking. ACE cough, you would take the patient off the medication. Eosinophilic airway diseases, a reasonable trial of inhaled corticosteroid, or perhaps a short course of prednisone. Rhinitis treatment with, I like to use a nasal rinse, um, uh, which is, I think, very effective for uh, mucus buildup and nasal clogging. I sometimes uh, augment that with a nasal steroid. Uh, and perhaps a, an antihistamine. Uh, Esophageal reflux, we've discussed. Uh, I very seldom send patients for esophageal manometry uh, or, in, uh, or esophageal impedance monitoring. Uh, and certainly, I never sent someone for uh, fundoplication, correlated disorder. Um, um, uh, my view on this is uh, a six to eight week trial of PPI. Uh, if it's not effective, uh, I leave it that it's not GI reflux. Uh, infection, operation, reassurance, cough suppression. This is the algorithm that we will go through now. We have assess this patient. Uh, the patient is a prior smoker but a non-smoker now. The diagnosis is cough hypersensitivity, which can be reversible and just indicated with some treatments for rational diagnosis. And then you have the rest of these patients, excuse me, the rest of patients with persistent uh, undiagnosed cough. And we just unexplained chronic cough. And if you're there and tell a patient that they've got unexplained chronic cough, they'll probably pick themselves up and go somewhere else. Um, second opinion. But to use cough reflex hypersensitivity. I think patients can, if it's explained well, I think patients can understand this as a chronic condition that waxes and wanes over time and immediately with a variety of measures. What we're seeing with is difficulty in objective measurement of cough. Um, there are a few ways to do this. Uh, there is cough frequency monitors, which is basically a recording and a patient diary. There are um, visual analog scales quality of life indices uh, that are probably going to be helpful for future studies. And occasional labs, we don't do this. Uh, uh, sensitivity to pepper extract is an indication of um, hypersensitivity of the, um, of the fibers that mediate the cough reflex. And with cough hypersensitivity, um, a great sensitivity to um, uh, capsaicin. Uh, and and in the final uh, slide or two, uh, this is my approach uh, to patients with uh, complex hypersensitivity of no clear diagnosis. Um, I have a uh, benzotinate, which is a little capsule uh, that uh, uh, has a little bit local anesthetic uh, that is swallowed and may uh, reduce sensitivity from lower esophageal uh, receptors. Uh, first generation uh, antihistamines are sometimes quite effective, they have sedation properties. Many of these patients have anxiety-related conditions, um, uh, uh, 
uh, sleep, from coughing, and these, uh, these agents are quite helpful sometimes. Uh, I've already mentioned uh, use of proton pump inhibitors. I sometimes use a short course of prednisone or prednisolone um, for patients who have intractable coughing uh, that may have something in the history associated with allergy. Uh, a short course of, of prednisone will exclude, if they do not respond, uh, allergic disease, eosinophilic disease, and asthma related. Methafan is available over the counter. That's the first step. An occasional codeine uh, just break the cycle a little bit um, so that they get a little bit rest at night. Um, the dangers, of course, are self-evident uh, in uh, chronic uh, dependency in the situation. Uh, occasionally use a lidocaine spray uh, to numb the, the back of the throat uh, in patients. Uh, who I think have uh, pharyngeal or nasopharyngeal sensitivity. Be careful with the agent uh, so meals. You don't want to block the uh, swallow reflex. But if you if 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 described carefully, explain to the patient can work sometimes. And a variety of experimental agents that make, that are designed to block the pathways that I've uh, outlined previously. Um, they're not the yet on the market, uh, but I would imagine that should any of them re reach the market, uh, uh, they would be a big, uh, they, they would be quite successful if they were effective. And, and then the most difficult probably um, is this last group, which is habitual, pathogenic, uh, um, a coughing, a stress-related, high degree of anxiety, uh, and, and depression, um, and uh, very disturbing and uncomfortable to patients, a deal of emotion associated with this, with this type of disorder, uh, and generally uh, need a multi-team uh, um, approach uh, to management of this particular condition, which can be very distressing. Thank you very much, Dr. Eden. That that was great. I um, just want to, uh, oh, I think people are unmuted. Want to let uh, anyone in our uh, Canadian uh, or Madrid offices or uh, if there's anyone in Miami uh, or, or who are working remotely uh, to ask any questions to Dr. Eden. I mean, I have questions, but I don't want I don't want to monopolize Dr. Eden. Yeah. Let me ask one. Let me ask one. And this is this is so much from the best doctor's perspective, but just from the primary care clinician. Um, earlier on in your um, in your you um, discussed ordering of um, uh, serum IgE and uh, uh, eosinophil count to help with uh, uh, your as you're going down different diagnostic um, pathways with cough. I was wondering if you could discuss a little bit more if you do it for all folks or or if there are certain situations where you do it and and how good or bad that is at um, excluding or including asthma because that's a test that I um, haven't used as much uh, in patients coming to me with cough. Right. So, um, so if you are thinking of an allergic, um, if you're thinking of an allergic uh, ETG, this is supporting, uh, supporting in in, this is supporting data. So this group of patients on the uh, right-hand side there, their right-hand side list, right. these are the type of patients where an allergic manifestation, an allergic sensitivity uh, can be, uh, be uh, diagnosed if they have a very high IgE, or have a high eosinophil count, it would point to um, IgE-mediated disease. Now, some of those IgE-mediated diseases are actually pulmonary diseases um, and uh, uh, would come under, uh, you know, clear manic those uh, 
in those patients called the clear manifestations of a allergic pulmonary disease. Uh, so a high IgE, for example, would point to uh, a potential asthma diagnosis, an allergic diagnosis, would point to a direction of exploring their environment a little bit more, uh, perhaps even taking a an allergic, a full allergic history. Perhaps right. there's a food that they are sensitive to. Perhaps there's a an environmental um, compound or exposure that they are sensitive to. As a screening test, if then it's negative, it doesn't really mean anything. But if you have an IgE that's three or four hundred, uh, you you uh, you might be facing um, an allergic disease. It has a little bit of a follow-up of that because the, the thing you know that the entity that's always that can be the, one of the bigger conundrums for me is um, cough variant asthma. Empiric trial of a bronchodilator, uh, if it doesn't help, is that um, how does that at excluding cough variant asthma? I think it's very good. Um, what I prefer to do is, if I'm considering that diagnosis, is to give them um, an inhaled steroid rather than a bronchodilator. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think a two or three week trial of uh, agent of an inhaled steroid is reasonable to exclude many of these on the, the right hand side uh, diagnosis. Right. That's exactly It helpful. should be a reasonable dose. It doesn't have to be the highest uh, concentration, uh, but, but it, sh it should be uh, uh, a uh, a length of time and the one would use for asthmatic for an asthmatic for asthmatic right. control in a moderate mild to moderate asthmatic. Excellent. That's very cool. Can I any other questions? Um, I know we're reaching the top of the hour. I could do a hundred questions, but any other questions from, from uh, around uh, uh, the globe? Right. Well then, I, again, Dr. Eden, thank you for this talk, and also thank you for your ongoing uh, collaboration in the service of uh, of our members. Uh, always, always appreciate it. Well, thank you much. I um, enjoyed uh, uh, giving the lecture very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eden. Take care. Yeah, thank bye you. Bye. Take care, everyone. Yep. Bye bye. Okay. Bye.